This fall of 2024 will mark the college basketball debut of Olivier Rio, a 7-foot 9-inch center at the University of Florida. According to Guinness Records, he is the tallest teenager and the tallest college athlete in the world. Over the next few years, he will creep even closer to Goliath, that 9-foot giant from the Bible which goes to show that healthy humans are indeed capable of reaching such a height. Though born in Quebec, Rio decided to attend high school at the prestigious IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida. Judging from his choice of a university, he must have felt at home in the Sunshine State. From the moment I learned of his presence here, I have wondered if Olivier ever heard the legends of giant men from Florida. And no, I'm not talking about the 6 foot 9 Baron Trump, the 7 foot 1 Shaquille O'Neal, or even the 8 foot plus Jack Earl, but rather the indigenous people of Florida and their prehistoric ancestors, who local legend tells us stood upwards of 9 feet tall. In this presentation, I will prove to you without a shadow of serpent's doubt that men of enormous height once roamed the dunes, glades, springs, and forests of Florida, and that nowhere else on earth is evidence of quote-unquote giants so abundant. Herein will be provided numerous eyewitness accounts, archaeological evidence, reputable newspaper articles, photographic evidence, the affirmative testimony of a Smithsonian anthropologist, ethnologist, a sheriff, judge, mayor, a Florida state governor, American president, and even irrefutable video evidence available only here at Old World Florida, so make sure to stay tuned until the very end. The views expressed in this video do not necessarily reflect my own. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida Baby. When the very first Europeans arrived to Florida in the 1500s, they encountered multiple races of gargantuan stature. As early as 1517, Spaniards were trading enslaved Indians from Florida, Georgia, and the Bahamas that they themselves termed gigantes, meaning giant. These gigantic slaves even fetched a much higher price than average-sized Indians. Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, Pedro de Salazar, and all others who encountered these giant Indians were in agreement about their stature. These aboriginals averaged well over seven feet in height, as will be proven shortly. In 1528, an expedition led by the Spanish conquistador Panfilo de Narvaez clashed with the extraordinarily tall Temucua and Apalachee Indians after landing near Tampa Bay, Florida. One of that expedition's few survivors, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, published the following in 1537, quote, All the Indians we had seen from Florida to here are archers, as they are of large build and go about naked. From a distance they appear to be giants. They are a people wonderfully well built, very lean and of great strength and agility. The bows they use are as thick as an arm and 11 or 12 spans long, so that they can shoot arrows at 200 paces with such great skill that they never miss their mark. There were men this day who swore that they had seen two oaks, each one of them as thick as a man's lower leg, pierced through and through by arrows of the Indians. And this is not to be wondered at, having seen the strength and skill with which they shoot them, because I myself saw an arrow in the base of a poplar tree that had entered it to a great depth." End quote. Though it has been retorted by some that Spaniards were so short in those days that anybody with above average height could seem like a giant, we ought to note that Panfilo de Narvaez, the leader of that particular expedition, stood a full six feet two inches tall thus debunking that foolish explanation. 
No mermaids, sea monsters, or any other discrediting elements are present in this account, for which reason it can be considered reliable. In 1539, an expedition led by the Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto clashed with those same tall Indians, also landing near Tampa Bay. Garci Lasso de la Vega published the following in 1601 regarding the Indian chief for whom the city of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, took its name, and an entirely separate race of titanic men in the lands then known as La Florida. Quote, Meanwhile, there came to him a son of Tascaloosa, a boy of eighteen years and such goodly stature that from the chest up he was taller than any Spaniard or Indian in the entire army. The physical measurements of Tascaloosa were like those of his son, for both were more than a half yard taller than all the others. He appeared to be a giant, or rather, was one, and his limbs and face were in proportion to the height of his body. His countenance was handsome, and he wore a look of severity, yet a look which well revealed his ferocity and grandeur of spirit. His shoulders conformed to his height, and his waistline measured just a little more than two-thirds of a yard. His arms and legs were straight and well-formed, and were in proper proportion to the rest of his body. In sum, he was the tallest and most handsomely shaped Indian that the Castilians saw during all their travels in Florida. Concerning the stature of Tascaloosa, Alonso de Carmona asserts that this man lacked very little of being a giant, and that he was excellently featured. Juan Colez, too, has the following to say of this tall, strong, and robust individual. When we had arrived in the province of the Lord Tascaloosa, he came out to us in peace. He was a mighty man, who had as much bone between his foot and his knee as another very large person might have between his foot and his waist. His eyes were like those of an ox, and along the road he traveled upon a horse, but the horse was unable to sustain him. The Adelantado, or Hernando de Soto, dressed him in fine scarlet cloth and gave him a very beautiful cape of the same material." End quote. A few chapters later, Garci Lasso reports the following, quote, Then in the afternoon of the third day, they caught sight of seven canoes setting out toward them from some rushes, and in the first of these canoes, they beheld an Indian very different in aspect and color from those they had left inland, for he was as large as a Philistine and as black as an Ethiopian. Standing in the prow of his canoe, this Indian shouted to the Castilians, in a gross and pompous voice." End quote. This account is particularly reliable, as it comes to us from a member of the Inca nobility who had served alongside the Spanish on this expedition. It has often been said that the Spanish embellished their feats in the New World, but an Inca man would not have had the need to exaggerate, nor would he fall victim to the exotic stimuli of the so-called New World. As with the previous testimony, no discrediting elements are present in this account. In 1565, an expedition led by the French Huguenot, René de Laudonnaire, landed near Jacksonville and were welcomed as friends by the Temucua Indians of Florida. An artist on that expedition, Jacques Lemoyne, made a number of illustrations and reported the following in regards to the stature of these Indians. Quote, this chief Athor is an extremely handsome man, intelligent, reliable, strong, of exceptional height, exceeding our tallest men by a foot and a half, and endowed with a certain restrained dignity, so that in him a remarkable majesty shone forth. He married his mother, and by her raised more children of both sexes. One of their chiefs asserted to me, that he was 300 years old, and that his father, whom he pointed out to me, was 50 years older than he." End quote. The tallest man on that Huguenot expedition probably stood around 6 foot 3, which would make the Temucua chiefs close to 8 feet tall. 
even if we suppose the tallest man was of Napoleonic stature, only five foot seven, that would still make the Temukua chiefs over seven feet tall. As with the previous testimony, no discrediting elements are present in this account. Though first-hand accounts like these are today foolishly regarded as legend by some academics, probably due to the fact that these Indians went extinct long before their institutions were founded, we ought to note that these testimonies were substantiated by the human remains exhumed from the mounds, middens, bogs, and springs of Florida before it became illegal to do so. Archaeologists, laborers, and hobbyists alike regularly discovered skeletons of colossal men between the years 1865 and 1965. It was the same mainstay publications which Floridians today rely on for accurate reporting, like the Tallahassee Democrat, Tampa Tribune, Miami Herald, and Palm Beach Post, that printed authoritative descriptions of these exceptionally sized human bones. Let us here list but a few. The Tallahassee Democrat printed the following on April 17, 1913. There were giants in early days of Florida, bones of thousands of victims of sacrifice offerings unearthed on the East Coast, discovery made by Jacksonville man, the measurements of the bones taken from the sacrificial mounds of the early Floridians indicate that the victim of the altar was at least eight feet tall. The New Smyrna Daily News reported the following on August 29, 1913. Relics of men of huge size discovered in the glades. Thigh bone found indicates early residents of swamps were of magnificent proportions. The St. Petersburg Daily Times reported the following on August 13, 1914. Race of giants once inhabited this peninsula. Mounds near Seminole Bridge give up bones of mammoth people. Must have been nine feet tall. The Tampa Sunday Times reported the following on September 6, 1914. Bones of real giants found. Extraordinary discoveries near St. Pete. Skeletons of men over seven feet high, said to have been dug up in mounds. The Palm Beach Post printed the following on March 14, 1920. Smithsonian Institute seeking information of ancient Abenakis, which by the way is a word that was used in Florida to describe an ancient race of giant Indians. The St. Petersburg Times reported the following on December 14, 1922. Big mound yields giant skeleton. The skeleton measured nine feet in length, and the jaws were large enough to take in that of an ordinary person. The Tampa Sunday Tribune printed the following on June 12, 1927. Amateur archaeologists find remains of Florida giants near Fort Myers, a race of giants unearthed. The Fort Myers Press printed the following on July 19, 1927. Giant skeletons are uncovered by island fishermen at Tampa. The Tampa Sunday Tribune reported the following on June 5, 1932. Early Florida Giants Bones Unearthed Near Fort Myers The Miami News printed the following on the 2nd of September, 1934. Skeletons of lost race unearthed near Silver Springs. Bones of giant race are found by CCC diggers. Theory of early white Americans voiced at Silver Springs. The Ocala area became so well known for the bones found there, belonging to giant skeletons, that a giant caveman was constructed over the entrance to the Ocala Caverns, a popular tourist destination at the time. The Stewart Daily News printed the following on September 15, 1934. Discover bones of giants near St. Lucie Inlet. Race of seven-foot men once lived or visited in this section. The Miami News printed the following on the 8th of June, 1936. Giant skeleton found on key. 
remains of prehistoric man unearthed near Cape Sable, reports that a treasure hunting party unearthed an eight-foot skeleton with a skull three-quarters of an inch thick on an island off Cape Sable were received today from Homestead. The Miami News printed the following on the 18th of August, 1936. Race of giants believed once living in Miami. First sheriff told about large bones unearthed here in Spanish War. The Pensacola News Journal printed the following on March 1, 1946. Indian Mound in Fort Walton holds secret of ancient bloody battle. The large, tree-covered Indian Mound above, in downtown Fort Walton, was first excavated during the Civil War and revealed skeletons of giants who fought bitterly in prehistoric times. The Tampa Tribune printed the following on November 27, 1955. Who were the Glades Giants? Were they born that way? Or did ancient Indians use bone-stretching formula? The Tampa Tribune printed the following on Christmas Day, 1955. Mound held giant bones. Tall Indians. This skeleton measured to nine feet tall. Though articles like these reported on the real-life findings of real-life archaeological sites, complete with photographs and eyewitness testimony, many have been swept under the rug in more recent years by newer generations of academics who have been mistakenly taught that such articles were the product of yellow journalism. That's right, according to the Smithsonian and Royal Society of England, all those who took time and effort to discover, handle, or report on these findings, must have been involved in or fallen victim to elaborate hoaxes. While hoaxes certainly did occur, most fraudulent specimens were discovered somewhere other than an Indian mound, only to be paraded around the country and exhibited for a fee. Either way, hoaxes are by no means unique to human skeletons, but rather show up in every area of archaeology. The ancient Indian mounds of Florida, however, consistently yielded abnormally sized bones to the profit of nobody. The professional reputations of the following commentators should help to erase that insulting and snobby superstition. In his Niagara Address, dated September of 1848, soon to be President Abraham Lincoln remarked the following, quote, The eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America, have gazed on Niagara, as ours do now. End quote. It has been foolishly argued by some academics that Lincoln was referring to mammoths or mastodons, but his mention of these bones' internment in earthworks removes any doubt as to their human origin. Many human skulls and bones of extraordinary size taken from local mounds and bodies of water, were actually in the possession of Florida's 20th state governor, Albert Gilchrist, for whom Gilchrist County was named. Albert even maintained a private museum during his governorship, showing these colossal relics to many reputable journalists and celebrities. Bones of giant men were frequently remarked upon by Donald Brennan McKay, the owner and editor of the Daily Times newspaper, who also served as mayor of Tampa from 1910 to 1920 and from 1928 to 1931. He was a founding member of the University of Tampa and was involved in the first commercial flight in the United States. McKay was born and laid to rest in Tampa, and having examined the remains of many local digs, knew better than anybody that those giant bones were a reality. Bones of giant men were also remarked upon by Florida's 1936 Republican candidate for governor, L. V. Edison Calloway, a judge and lawyer involved in the Scopes Monkey Trials. Calloway was a Baptist preacher since the age of 17, a Freemason, Shriner, and friend to multiple presidents including Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt. Remains of giant men found in Florida 
were mentioned in his 1966 book entitled In the Beginning. It wasn't just government officials who knew about these exceptional human remains, but law enforcement too. The following comes to us from Pioneer, Florida by D.B. McKay, dated 1960, with the Tampa Sunday Tribune. Quote, A few years ago, former Sheriff Wiggins of Glades County built a home on a mound within his pasture. The site is about three miles from the old ceremonial mound near Fort Center on Fish Eating Creek, which is the highest soil mound in Glades or Highlands County. When excavating for the foundation and septic tank, he uncovered large leg and arm bones. He estimated the people were near seven feet tall. For those wondering where the physical evidence for such a gigantic race of men can be found today, that question would have to be directed to the Smithsonian Institution, as many, if not most of these remains, were sent to them in good faith for further examination, but instead were never heard of again. Such a conspiracy has been the focus of numerous books and even takes up a good portion of the giant human skeleton Wikipedia. The Smithsonian denies any such tampering, but though I cannot speak for other states, there is more than enough evidence to show that this was the fate for numerous remains from Florida. Perhaps the most famous archaeological find in all of Florida, and the one most crucial to our understanding of American prehistory, would have to be the so-called Vero Man, discovered around Vero Beach, Florida, between 1915 and 1916. The reason these remains are so significant is the fact that they were discovered alongside extinct animals from the Pleistocene, a geological epoch ranging from 11,700 years ago to 2.5 million years ago. The suggestion that humans were present in Florida during the Pleistocene was extremely controversial in 1916. Since 1846, the Smithsonian Institution had been asserting that mankind did not enter the Americas until only 6,000 years ago, at the earliest. Thus, most of the mainstream archaeologists refused to accept that Vera Man was over 12,000 years old, or much older. The state geologist of Florida, however, E. H. Sellards, dated the site closer to 100,000 years Vero Man was eventually verified as authentic, but when the remains were sent to the Smithsonian for further analysis, they were simply reported as lost and never heard of again. A newspaper article from the Tampa Tribune, dated February 14, 1925, regarding a separate incident, reads as follows, quote, Skeletal remains of Florida giant is discovered. The bones are thought to be those of a male, and indicated, according to local authorities, a probable height of not less than seven feet. The specimens are being prepared for shipment by A.C. Bevis of New York to the Smithsonian Institution, which has already dispatched one expedition to Florida to excavate shell mounds on the west coast in search of proof of the giant race theory, with so far negative results." End quote. The St. Lucie News Tribune reported the following on August 13, 1927. Quote, giant Indian skeletons uncovered in Florida. The skulls larger than those of current history, battered and crushed, indicated tribal battles. The jaw and teeth are unusually large. Likewise are the body bones, indicating the Indians of past ages were veritable giants in comparison with those of today. Mounds similar to the one in which the bones were unearthed are common in the state. The bones have been sent to 
the Smithsonian Institution for further examination, end quote. These two were never heard of again. It is also a fact that the Smithsonian personally dispatched the Czech immigrant Alice Herdlicka, its first curator of physical anthropology, from 1904 until 1941, to debunk or delegitimize the giant skeletons being discovered in every corner of Florida. More than a century after his successful crusade, to undermine the earnest archaeology done by dozens of Floridians, Herdlicka's methods have since been labeled unethical, even by his peers. But even he, the number one skeptic or Agent Smith of his day, in response to the incessant outpour of abnormally large human skeletons from Florida, conceded the following in his 1922 book entitled Anthropology of Florida. Quote, Massiveness. Many of the Florida skulls and lower jaws, as well as the bones of the skeleton, impress one as perceptibly stouter and especially heavier than other skeletal remains of Indians. So far as some of the individual skulls and jaws are concerned, nothing equally massive is in fact known from any part of the continent except under abnormal conditions. In strength, the Florida femur shows well above the general Indian average in males and slightly above also in the females. Exactly the same will be seen with the tibia. The stoutness of the skulls was apparent on most of the material that passed through the writer's hands in the present study. They are remarkable for massiveness and thickness. The average thickness through the parietal bones amounting to almost double the usual thickness. The lower parts of the parietal, one centimeter above and along the squamous suture in Florida skulls, measured often six to eight millimeters, which is approximately two to three millimeters more than in whites and 1.5 millimeters more than in other Indians. The occipital crests, the mastoids, the zygomes in males are often heavier the facial parts more massive, the lower jaws in general thicker and larger than in most other parts of America. The features in the living must have been correspondingly strong, which, together with a good height of the body, accounts doubtless for the reports by early travelers as to the size and strength of the people, as it accounts for most of the reports of Florida Giants, which are reaching the press and our institutions now from amateur explorers. In the first place, the occipital foramina of these remarkable skulls are abnormally large and remain open even in the most mature of them. As to some of the individual jaws from Florida, there are five in the U.S. National Museum that are truly huge. Their measurements are given separately in the third of the tables that follow, but the visual impression they produce is even greater. There is nothing that would equal these specimens as a whole in the National Museum collections, except a fresh jaw of a Mongolian collected by the writer in 1912 at Urga. It is small wonder that amateur collectors in Florida, finding now and then such a jaw, attribute it to giants." End quote. Smithsonian anthropologist Alice Herdlicka did bring up at least one valid point, however, that the height of Florida Indians could have been exaggerated by their elongated skulls, believed to be the result of cranial deformation, probably by the use of a cradle board. We resume from The Anthropology of Florida. Quote, Deformation, the majority of Floridian skulls show artificial molding. There is but one type of this, the fronto-occipital flattening, but in some instances the frontal parts have been so little affected that the occipital compression alone is perceptible." End quote. Elongated skulls and others with strange shapes and features have been found in every corner of the state. Of the few Floridians who even know that elongated skulls exist, even fewer know that they can be found in Florida. It is mistakenly supposed by many 
that elongated skulls only come from places like Peru, largely in part due to shows like Ancient Aliens. For those who would still doubt the presence of extraordinarily tall people in prehistoric Florida, we need only examine their closest living descendants as the ultimate evidence for their stature. Though the indigenous people of peninsular Florida largely went extinct in the 1700s, the few surviving members of the Apalachee, Calusa, Temucua, and so on, were absorbed into the newly formed Seminole tribe of Florida. Many people know that the Plains Indians are today remembered as the tallest people on earth in the 1800s, with the men averaging 5 foot 10. But I will show that the modern day Muscogee speaking Indians and Seminoles of Florida were much taller than that. The gall which it took for Smithsonian officials to deny the presence of gigantic men in America, while their overly sized descendants still drew breath in this continent, is impressive to say the least. The following comes to us from The Seminole Indians of Florida, dated 1884, by Civil War veteran and Smithsonian ethnologist Clay McCauley. Quote, Physically, both men and women are remarkable. The men, as a rule, attract attention by their height, fullness, and symmetry of development, and the regularity and agreeableness of their features. In muscular power, and constitutional ability to endure they excel. Today, their men might be taken as types of physical excellence. The physique of every tiger warrior I met would furnish proof of this statement. The tigers are dark, copper-colored fellows, over six feet in height, with limbs in good proportion, their hands and feet well-shaped, and not very large, their stature erect, their heads are large, and their foreheads full and marked. An almost universal characteristic of the tiger's face is its squareness. A widened and protruding under jawbone giving this effect to it. Two of the warriors permitted me to manipulate the muscles of their bodies. Under my touch, these were more like rubber than flesh. Noticeable among all are the large calves of their legs the size of the tendons of their lower limbs, and the strength of their toes." End quote. Now we turn to a work by Minnie Moore Wilson, one of the tribe's earliest advocates, dated 1895. Quote, In personal appearance, many a seminal brave might be taken as a type of physical excellence. He is bright copper in color, is over six feet in height, his carriage is self-reliant, deliberate and strong." End quote. The following comes to us from Donald Brenham McKay, mayor of Tampa and the owner slash editor of the Tampa Daily Times newspaper, dated January 1st, 1960. Quote, Indians were six feet tall. Chipko was about six feet two or three inches. His brother, who was the first chief of the Seminoles in Oklahoma, called Long John, was six feet six inches tall. His brother, who was the father of Chief Tallahassee, was over six feet. His niece, Martha Tiger, was almost six feet, and of the three Tom Tigers, all were over six feet. Captain Tom Tiger was six feet six inches and weighed almost 300 pounds. According to his son, Naha, who recently died, Billy Bowlegs III says these Seminoles, now deceased, were six feet and over. Old Cypress Charlie and his four sons, Whitney, Wilson, Futch, and Charlie Cypress. Old Charlie and son Jimmy Doctor. Old Charlie and son Sam Huff. Big Charlie, six feet four. Coffee Gopher, Tom Jumper, Josie Jumper, Charlie Peacock and his brother, John, Tommy Doctor, and Jimmy Doctor. Those living whom I can recall are Reverend Henry Cypress, six feet four, Sam Tony, Jack, John, 
and Frank Tommy, and their grandfather, Old Tom, Jumper, Tom, and Morgan Smith, the largest man among the Seminoles. Joe and Toby Johns, Willie and John Henry Gopher. Only a few of the older deceased have been mentioned, but the present day Seminoles are, to me, evidence that there have been and now are many who are large and some very tall. There seems to be ample evidence that Florida was once populated with many very large and tall people." End quote. The reliable source for most of those heights was Billy Bowlegs III, a Seminole chief who himself stood six feet two inches and lived to 103 years of age. In fact, it was very common for Seminole Indians of both sexes to surpass a hundred years of age, thus strengthening their link to the prehistoric Indians of Florida, who as described earlier, stood closer to eight or nine feet tall and reached 350 years of age. So renowned were the Seminole Indians for their height that in 1921, the welcome sign to Hialeah, Florida was a 25 foot tall Seminole Indian standing over County Road. Though not born in Florida, the closely related Muscogee Indian actor, painter, and rodeo performer, Will Sampson, stood six feet seven inches, as seen alongside Jack Nicholson in The One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. For those unimpressed, who may be thinking that six and a half feet is a far cry from the giant Indians reported by early European explorers, and the eight to nine foot long skeletons discovered around Florida, we ought to enumerate the reasons for such a disparity. Number one, science has long recognized that many animals alive on Earth today are the miniature versions of creatures who lived thousands of years ago. Number two, domesticated animals are typically shorter than their wild counterparts and the integration of these wild Indians into modern society is the human equivalent of domestication. Number three, the height of any population drops when subjected to starvation and disease, as were the American Indians. Number four, since the ruling elite and warrior class of Florida Indians were the tallest, they were also the first to be exterminated. Number five, the traditional methods of increasing height used by native Floridians were lost to the ages. And or number six, if a race of eight to nine foot tall giants were to reproduce with a race of five foot tall humans, one could deduce that their offspring would stand six and a half feet tall, like the Seminole Indians of Florida. Despite all the censorship and Smithsonian cover-up, some extraordinarily large human bones still remain in the possession of Florida state academics, which could never be labeled a hoax or miscalculation. For our grand finale, I'd like to share with you some videographic evidence featuring Dr. Jeffrey Thomas with the FSU Department of Anthropology. Of all the videos from around the world which appear to show the remains of extraordinarily tall humans, the following one from Florida would have to be the most verifiable. All of the Wendover uh, post crania is kind of held, housed in these cabinets, and the crania is just around the corner. Uh, so just to kind of show you some of the ideas about the preservation, right? this is one of the males, adult males, that's absolutely massive. Absolutely massive. These individuals were very large, and the I mean, preservation is just so immaculate. But it's, it's hard to believe that these are 8,000 years old. I mean, we've had researchers come in here and say, are you sure that they're, <laughs> they're this old? They really could be a lot younger. So even just compared to me, right, in terms of a hip placement, my knee is up here and I'm 5'11". So these are really large individuals. Really large individuals. Right. And we have some with very unique traits. Uh, For reference, Dr. Jeffrey Thomas told us he stands about 5 feet 11 inches. The average femur belonging to a man of his size would be 19 and a half inches. 
a femur belonging to a man the size of Shaquille O'Neal, 7 foot 1, would only be about 22 inches long. Now, I've had construction workers, carpenters, and handymen tell me that the femur which Dr. Thomas is holding could be as long as 25 inches, thus belonging to a man of titanic stature. In review, we have shown that healthy humans are today capable of growing to biblical heights, that the earliest European explorers to Florida interacted with and reported on living, breathing men of gigantic stature, that large human bones fitting these descriptions were regularly exhumed from Florida, that these findings were printed by mainstay publications, that numerous high-ranking government officials were proponents of the so-called giant human skeleton theory, that the Smithsonian Institution has been accused of engaging in a conspiracy to cover up evidence of gigantic bones in America, that large human skeletons from Florida were indeed lost after being sent to the Smithsonian for further examination, that some abnormally long bones are in the possession of Florida State University, that even the greatest skeptic and opponent conceded bones from Florida are larger than elsewhere, that the living, breathing Indians of Florida serve as great evidence that their predecessors were even larger, that photographic and video evidence of abnormally large human bones does exist, and that with the right academic clearance at Florida State University, one can even hold such bones in their own hands. In conclusion, I hope you enjoyed this presentation, but stay tuned for a couple ways you can support the channel. Peace. Here are a couple of ways you can support the channel. Make sure to check out Florida's number one metaphysical book and crystal store, The Dancing Elephant in Palm Beach County. You just might find me there at work. If you're not in the area, go use the code OWF at dancingelephant.shop for 10% off. Monad is a compendium of philosophical writings by three major Neoplatonist philosophers, Plotinus, Porphyry, and Proclus. The most accurate and potent translations of the Neoplatonists were done by Thomas Taylor in the early 1800s, and we have made those translations available in a new hardcover edition, limited to 2,000 copies. This book is an 800-page hardcover behemoth featuring an introduction by the one and only Ken Wheeler, with cover art by Benjamin A. Vierling, and a frontispiece by Kuba Sikalski. Copies can be purchased for a discounted price of $50 during our pre-sale, to be found at, galloglassbooks.shop. Unleash your crown chakra with our 100% cotton make Atlantis Great Again visors, available at oldworldflorida.myshopify.com. Shop Butterfly Pea Flower Tea and Shilajit with code, OWF for 10% off at, sipblue.com. Shop Organic Moringa with code, Old World Florida for 10% off at, themoringaman.com. Join our Patreon for uncensored, ad-free content, patreon.com slash oldworldflorida. Some of the music featured in this video was created by Dr. Longo. Some of it was sourced from public archives, but a majority was composed by Rustin Gross, a multi-instrumentalist and professional musician residing in Palm Beach County, Florida. You can support Rustin by following him on Instagram, Rustin, underscore, Gross with an E, or visiting his website www.rustinmusic.com.